so uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Wade Bowweiler lectureship. Uh, Dr. Bowweiler was the first division head of gastroenterology, and he actually led the division for 31 years. So I only have 29 more years there, Bill. Showcases of the um, of the division, um, and in fact, I'm, I'm really, really very pleased to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Guadalupe Garcia Chow, who is our Wade Bowler lecture lecture for 2012. Um, Dr. Garcia Chow is a professor of internal medicine at Yale University. She is also the chief of the section uh, at the VA, uh, Connecticut, uh, the pro program director of a, of a national program of a hepatitis C resource center, only one of four in the country. Uh, director of the clinical Before the Yale uh, uh, NIH funded uh, Yale Liver Center. And I'm especially pleased uh, that she was able to carve time out this year because she's the current president of the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease, which is, of course, our premier hepatology uh, uh, investigative society, uh, both at the US and also nationally. Guadalupe um, got her medical degree from Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México and did her internal medicine residency and gastroenterology fellowship at the Instituto Nacional de Nutrición. Um, she retrieved her hepatology training at Yale, and I think has been there ever since. So they've been quite lucky. Um, she's, gosh, published more than 150 uh, peer-reviewed uh, primary uh, manuscripts in, in journals such as New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA Hepatology. Uh, she has a, a whole variety of grant support, actually really funded by the NIH and the VA. Um, and uh, I've had her main areas of interest have been focused in uh, cirrhosis, uh, varicell hemorrhage, and spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. And this is actually where I got to meet uh, Lupe most closely about a dozen years ago. I, I was in, we were invited to uh, create the international guidelines on the management of ascites and spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. It was part of the International Ascites Club. Uh, That's which right. you think is like, what is that? That's right. it's, a, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. And in fact, this one article, um, this one article that was the consensus guideline, in fact, is to this date is still uh, my one publication that has the most uh, citations of any other that I've had. I'm not even a hepatologist. It has over 400 public citations. It's amazing. Um, so, so, uh, so a couple things that you should know about, about uh, Lupe. It, some of these things that clinically we know, but Dr. Garcia Chow is the one who established them, such as the threshold portal pressure for the development of, of varices, which is that 12 millimeters gradient. Uh, also, the cutoff for the absolute PMN count for diagnosing SPP of you know 250 for high power field. That's Dr. Dr. Garcia Chow. And also, she performed the actually I think the one and only uh, randomized controlled trial for the use of non-selective beta blockers for the prevention of uh, varices and var first varicel hemorrhage. So these are things that that are so important clinically um, that uh, Dr. Gar Dr. Garcia Chow has really led the, led the field in this. And in fact, is the uh, 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 guideline author of the current ASLD ACG guideline for the management of varices and varicel hemorrhage. Um, she's currently an associate editor for, for hepatology. And apparently this is a, a, a huge amount of work and hepatology, of course, is the major journal for the ASLD. Um, and, uh, both uh, clinical and basic research uh, is presented in this, this international journal. Um, she's gotten a whole bunch of awards. Uh, a few of them include uh, Fellow of the Royal College of Physicians, American College of uh, Physicians, and the Mexican Academy of Sciences. And so uh, uh, Lupi is our, our full while the visiting professor. Uh, tonight, she's going to speak on management of varices and varicel hemorrhage at our Pacific Northwest GI Society. And tomorrow at GI Frontier, she'll talk about the a new pathophysiologic classification of cirrhosis. But today, today she's going to talk to us about uh, cirrhosis, natural history, pathogenesis, and management. So please help me welcome Dr. Guadalupe Garcia Chow. <laughs> 
Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, John, for that incredibly nice introduction. It's, you know, it's a little bit too much, but anyhow, <laughs> here I am, and I'm honored actually to be here. Uh, and I thank John very much for having invited me to do this. Today, I'm going to try and put the context of, of, of cirrhosis in terms of its natural history, its pathogenesis, and, and what we do to manage it at different stages. And I think we're at the era where cirrhosis did not just cirrhosis. We have to stratify these patients in different risk categories, and, and, and this is how we base the therapy. So what we consider cirrhosis is the end stage of the fibrotic process that any chronic liver disease will lead to. So alcohol is still one of the most important ones, viral hepatitis, NASH, cholestatic autoimmune. All these chronic liver diseases will lead to increasing liver fibrosis and to the formation of cirrhosis. And this was the, 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 the concept, you know, you have cirrhosis, that's the end. But now we have a paradigm shifting concept where we know that at a minimum, cirrhosis has to be subclassified in two different prognostic entities, compensated and decompensated. And this is a clinical classification. So that decompensation is defined by the presence of variceal hemorrhage, ascites that's clinically detectable, and encephalopathy. So these are all clinical complications that define the patient that has transitioned from a compensated to a decompensated stage. And they're prognostically entirely different. This is the, the, the survival of a compensated patient as long as they remain compensated. The median survival is greater than 12 years in this study. This was a study uh, in, a, in a huge Italian cohort. Whereas once the patient develops a decompensating event, the survival goes down to about two years. This is the median survival. So you have to understand that if a patient has to wait two years to get a liver transplant, that's when they decompensate, when you're going to start thinking of referring this patient for liver transplantation totally different entities, you know, like, like John said, I'm, 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 I'm AE for hepatology right now. You should see a number of papers that are sent where they combine all these patients together. Co combining a compensated, decompensated patient is like putting together apples and oranges. So this is something that I think is very important. Now these complications, and, and, and I have taken jaundice out of it because if you read the old paper, jaundice is part of the, comp but I think this is further decompensation. Cirrhosis leads to two main syndromes, portal hypertension and liver insufficiency. And variceal, and variceal, and variceal hemorrhage are a direct result of portal hypertension. So is ascites, it comes from, from, from sinusoidal hypertension. And cephalopathy sort of a mixed bag. It comes from portal systemic shunting and liver insufficiency. And jaundice is entirely from having liver failure. Now, we'll talk a little bit about this. So clearly, you know, these three complications have to do with portal hypertension mostly. And so, and this is, this is, this is no, uh, not a surprise, therefore, that in this study, so this is our study that John was making reference to. This is a, a placebo-controlled trial of timolol, which is a non-selective beta blocker in patients with supercompensated cirrhosis. So these were patients that at the outset had cirrhosis, had portal hypertension, but did not have varices and were totally compensated. And we looked at, at and, and we measured pressures at baseline and then during follow-up, but these are the baseline results for, for pressure. We found uh, over time, we, 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 we looked at the patients who developed clinical decompensation, ascites, variceal hemorrhage, or hepatic encephalopathy. And we found that the strongest predictor of who was going to decompensate was the hepatic venous pressure gradient, which is a measure of portal pressure. And the cutoff was 10. So if you had more than 10, you were more likely to decompensate than if you did not. And the hazard ratio was 3.95. That is, you know, so the patient who has a beta ratio be greater than 10 has 3.95 times the risk of development decompensation. The merit predicted value is 90%, meaning that if the patient has less than 10 millimeters of mercury, 90% of them will be free of decompensation in the follow-up time, which was about four years. Now, in honor of Dr. Rollweiler, and, and I have always sort of, my thing has always been portal hypertension, but we have to think of the other syndrome, which is liver insufficiency. And Dr. Rollweiler actually dedicated a lot to looking at the synthesis of protein and the turnover of protein. And in this study, another independent predictor was the serum albumin. And, and, but this is, these are very compensated patients, so the cutoff was four. 
clearly not as good as the HVPG. The heart cell ratio was two compared to 3.95, and, and the narrow predicted value was only 77% compared to 90%. But still, think about that. Even in this very compensated state, there's some evidence of liver insufficiency reflected by a low alveolar. We're talking low alveolar less than 4.0, so even an alveolar of 3.8 would be predictive of decompensation. So, but still, portal pressure is important. So, how, how, what is the pathogenesis of having a high portal pressure? You have an, the first thing that happens: you have an increase in resistance to portal flow. This is fixed initially. There's nodules, there's fibrosis, but there's an, also an element of active vasoconstriction inside the liver. So it's both fixed and functional. This right away leads to increase in portal pressure, and the immediate consequence of having high pressure is that you have collaterals that open up, and these are varices. And um, you, you know you 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 often hear that when you're with radiology and they see that an, a, a task and then you see all the collaterals and they say oh my god this patient may not have portal hypertension anymore because it's the system is all collateralized. Well, this is not so because at the same time that collaterals are being formed, there is splachmic vasodilatation. So these are arterials that lead, go to the gut, that are vasodilated, more flow to the gut more flow out of the gut, so the portal blood inflow increases, and this maintains the portal hypertensive state. So even if the system is entirely collateralized, you will still have something that maintains this high portal pressure, which is splachmic vasodilatation. At the same time, we also have systemic vasodilatation that leads to a hyperdynamic circulatory state. You know, all of you who have been in, in, in the ICU with patients with cirrhosis know that they have a high cardiac output, low SVR. This is the hyperdynamic circulatory state. This increases the flow even more. Varices then grow, and you will have the complications of variceal hemorrhage, ascites, and encephalopathy. This hyperdynamic circulatory state is the one that, that allows you to have sodium retention, as we'll see later on. Now, I've added this because clearly what I've shown you is that there's still, even though less important than, than portal pressure, there's still an element of liver failure that is, that is facilitating these clinical com complications. So let's talk about portal pressure. And the key here is if this is really important, the pathogenesis is bringing down the pressure going to be important. And this is a study in patients who had bled. They had all bled from varices. This is the incidence of rebleeding when they're on, on pharmacological therapy. And if the HVPG goes down to less than 12, the patient is essentially protected from rebleeding. If even the, the grading goes down more than 20% from baseline, there's still a, a much lower rate of variceal rebleeding compared to patients in whom there is no change in HVPG. And these patients that decrease to less than 12 or who decrease the HVPG greater than 20% from baseline are what we call HVPG responders. And these responders have shown not only to have a, a decreased incidence of rebleeding, but they also have a lower incidence of ascites and encephalopathy, showing again that if you can bring down the pressure, you're going to decrease the incidence of complications. So how are we going to bring down that pressure? And these are the different therapies that we have to treat portal hypertension. Um, and it all has to do with where they act. Do they act on, on resistance inside the liver? Do they, do they add decreasing splachmic blood flow? And therefore, portal pressure. Vasoconstrictors, like non-selected beta blockers, act by causing splachmic vasoconstriction. They decrease portal venous inflow. At the same time, there's a little decrease in flow through the collateral. So the collateral gets smaller. There's a, some kind of an increase in resistance to the portal flow. And this results in a modest decrease in portal pressure. Vasodilators, the only example that I have, so we need vasodilators that act inside the liver. Nitrates and, and, and all the others act also inside and outside the liver. So it's difficult to say. But simvastatin, I'll show you a little data on this leads to a decrease in portal venous resistance, which seems to be inside the liver, increased nitric oxide there, no effect on flow. So there's a slight but significant decrease in portal pressure. When you combine a vasoconstrictor and a vasodilator, like this case of carvedilol, you'll have a synergistic effect in the reduction of portal pressure. We're going to discuss this a little bit. And of course, endoscopic therapy, either ligation or sclerotherapy, you're sticking a scope in there, you're ligating the veins, you know, it has no effect on resistance or flow, and no, no effect on portal pressure. It's a local therapy. Ultimately, portal systemic shunting, where you're shunting the blood away from the liver, is going to result, it's going to excite, you're going to take away that increased resistance. There's an actual increase in flow, but you're actually normalizing portal pressure. But the reason this is not our, a, a, in general, not the first-line therapy is because it has consequences of diverting the flow away from the liver.
So let's talk a little bit about the Simba study. This is just a proof of concept studies. Currently, there is a study in Europe comparing uh, beta blockers versus placebo and beta blockers versus simvastatin in preventing complications of incompensated patients. And, and this is a study. It, it, it had been shown in animals that, that it would decrease, uh, increase nitric oxide inside the liver. So this is placebo and simvastatin, double blind. This is the HVPG portal pressure, no change well, with placebo after uh, four weeks on, on, simba, on placebo, whereas there was a, a slight but significant decrease in, in patients who receive simvastatin. Uh, the paddock blood flow did not change. So if flow did not change, it means that this reduction was due to a decrease in resistance. And this is what they found. This is the percent change in HVPG, much larger with simvastatin. And it didn't matter whether the patients were or were not on beta blockers. And it didn't matter whether the patient was compensated or decompensated. So this is more to come. This is just a proof of concept study. So, when we see the patient with cirrhosis, the first question in our mind is, is this patient compensated or decompensated? And the whole management is going to be different. So the patient is compensated. This is when we want to treat the etiology. This is of the essence. And we have to screen and prevent. I, I don't have time to talk about HCC, but this can develop both in the compensated and the decompensated patient. But we want to screen and prevent. We, um, so, so what are uh, other um, predictor of, of decompensation? It is also derived from our Timol study was obesity. And you can see here how obese and up to 60 months is when, when, when this is very clear. Obese patients had a much higher rate of decompensation than overweight and these in turn had a higher risk than normal BMI patients. And this was independent of the HVPG. This was independent of everything. Obese patients seem to decompensate more. So one thing one can do to compensate patient is to try and have them lose weight. And there are trials now ongoing, trying to measure the pressure and see what happens when the patients lose weight. The other thing we can screen and prevent for is for varices. And this was the study we were talking about. You know, even within the compensated patients, there's two sub categories, the patient without varices and the patient with varices. And, 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 and we have found that in patients without varices have a very low mortality. So do patients with varices, but still these patients have a higher mortality than the patient without varices. These are varices who have not bled. These are still compensated patients. So the key here was to try and see, can we prevent this from happening? Can we prevent patients without varices to develop varices? And this was a, a study that took us a, over 10 years. Uh, we concluded that the development of virus could not be prevented with beta blockers, so it is not recommended to use um, non-selected beta blockers to, to prevent the formation of viruses in very compensated patients. So the next step is, can we screen for virus? Can we prevent variceal hemorrhage? All right, and the size of the viruses, as you would expect, is the main predictor of hemorrhage. So we have cirrhotic patients that have no viruses to patients who have developed <laughs> small viruses, patients who have large varices, and these are the ones that are more likely to have this horrible complication, which is variceal hemorrhage. And this is a summary, again, of a meta-analysis of eight trials um, on, on therapy of beta blockers in patients with medium to large varices, which are the varices that are more likely to bleed. Without therapy, 30% of them will bleed in, in, in a median follow-up of about 12, uh, 24 months. It goes down by more than half to 14% with beta blockers, with a sort of tendency for a better survival, but this has not been significant. So for the longest time, we use beta blockers alone. But then ligation came along, and these are the trials that compare ligation versus beta blockers. So in these trials, ligation was better than beta blockers without differences in survival. But if you look at this 21% bleeding rate with beta blockers, it's much higher than the 14% that we had seen in the trials of beta blockers versus placebo. So there's something wrong with these patients that were treated with beta blockers. And in fact, in, um, in a Cochrane meta-analysis, and there's a more recent one last month by the same uh, group, by the Cochrane group, that showed that if you look at good quality trials where there was a, a proper randomization, or if you look at full, full papers that are fully published, taking away the abstract, there's really no significant differences between ligation and beta blockers. So as far as we're concerned, we consider these two therapies equivalent. So what do we do when we have a compensated cirrhotic patient? We screen with an endoscopy. You know, people are trying to look at non-endoscopic means. We can discuss this. Um, if you have medium to large varices, 
you use one or the other. These are low risk patients. You don't want to have double the side effects. You use non-selective beta blockers, and it's very important that it's non-selective because the beta two effect is the one that causes splanchnic vasoconstriction. So it's either propanol or natal or ligation. And what is the choice? Depends on patient preference, contraindications, local resources. What we do, and obviously I'm totally biased in this respect, is we start on beta blockers and we switch to ligation if the patient cannot tolerate the beta blockers. And I'll show you why. This is not just without reason. If the patient's on beta blockers, you want to aim for a heart rate of 50 to 55 beats per minute, and there's no need to repeat the endoscopy anymore once the patient is on beta blockers. And the reason I would prefer beta blockers is if, because if you can have a reduction in, 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 in portal pressure, and, and here in the very compensated patient, a reduction of only 10%, which is really, really a very small improvement, will improve outcomes. Not only first variceal hemorrhage, which is obviously better in responders, but in survival. So those patients whose whose portal pressure goes down by a minimal amount can actually be, have survive. And there's a more recent study from this year that showed that responders also have a significantly lower risk of developing ascites and other complications of ascites. So that's why I prefer to start with beta blockers. And if the patient cannot tolerate them, we would go on to ligation. Now, there's a new kit in the blood, well, not that as new anymore, which is carvedilol. So this is a non-selective but vasodilating beta blocker. And we hope that this vasodilating effect gets, takes place inside the liver. There's proof of concept studies before that showed that carvedilol lowers portal pressure more than propanol, for example. But they used doses that were higher than this. They were using doses of 25 milligrams a day. And, and in these proof of concept studies that showed that although portal pressure reduction is greater with carvedilol, they also had more of the peripheral vasodilating effect so that these patients develop more ascites and they had more uh, increases in creatinine. So that was a problem. So that's why this group in, in the UK said, let's use lower doses. So this is 12.5 milligrams a day. They showed that, that carvedilol had a much lower rate of first variceal hemorrhage compared to ligation. And this was significant without changes in mortality and without any differences in, 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 in side effects. The problem is that this is the only trial. If you compare them to published data with ligation and non-selected beta blockers, carvedilol sits around there, so in the lower end of non-selected beta blocker studies. And the ligation arm of this tripathy study is in sort of the upper end of, of ligation. I know that there's another similar tri trial taking place in, um, in, in Europe, but I think that the main question remains is which of these two is more important? Because I think that with carvedilol, you have the deleterious vasodilating effect. Now, having said that, Carvedilol seems to be better tolerated than beta blockers, particularly at this dose. So it's important to see, you know, I would love to see the study that compares non-selected beta blockers with carvedilol. Baveno conference, we have all these consensus conferences, the International Scientist Club, this is Baveno, show that this is a promising alternative that needs to be further explored. So it's not out there yet. Now let's go to the decompensated patient, the patient that presents with variceal hemorrhage. And we have done a good job, you know, over the years, you know, the survival of a patient with variceal hemorrhage has improved. And, 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 and it's because the treatments have improved and, 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 and they ascribe this improvement in survival on the current standard, which was the use of a vasoactive drug, but mostly the use of antibiotics and ligation. So what do we do when the patient gets in there? Um, you know, first of all, we have to resuscitate the patient. But we've always said, you know, it's very rare that a patient that comes in with a variceal hemorrhage when you do the endoscopy that the patient is actively bleeding because as they bleed and the volume gets depleted, there's a decrease in flow, there's a decrease in, in bleeding. So you don't want to tank up the patient too much. And there, this had always been a theoretical concern, but now there's evidence for this. This is a, a, an abstract. It hasn't been published in long form because they were waiting to accrue more patients. So they look at treatment failure and at mortality in patients that were randomized to either cautious transfusion, keeping the hemoglobin around seven, versus liberal transfusion. And at the end, these patients ended up having a hemoglobin of around nine. I keep telling my residents at Yale that if it had been done at Yale, this would be like around 13. But anyhow, so, <laughs> so, so anyhow, so, so they did randomize. This is a study in Spain, right? So treatment failure was defined as either they could not stop the hemorrhage or the patient rebleeds within the first five days. 
And you can see here how clearly those who were cautiously transfused had less treatment failure than those that were liberally transfused. And there was a tendency for a decreased mortality. And this is what they were waiting to, to see if there was different, if they got more patients. So for now, so what we do is this, this is a standard therapy. We resuscitate, we maintain the hemoglobin around seven to eight. We start antibiotics, and I'll show you the evidence for this later on in the talk. And we start octreotide infusion, which is the only vasoconstrictor that we have in the US. And we start them in the emergency room as soon as you suspect that the patient may be having a variceal hemorrhage. Then we do an endoscopy within 12 hours. And if a variceal source is confirmed, you do ligation, all right? And so far, the standard of therapy says that we do tips in patients who fail this standard therapy. The, um, however, what happens when you put tips in these patients? And these are, these are all studies where tips was used as salvage therapy in patients who fail standard therapy. And first of all, you know, you can see that the control of bleed is outstanding once you put the tips in, but the mortality is huge. All right? And, and so they die, but they don't not, they, they die without bleeding. And, but, <laughs> Uh, the, the, the key here is that most of the patients who fail therapy are child C patients. In all these series, the majority were child C. And these are sort of old studies, but there's a recent study from this month in, in, in American Journal of Gastro that again showed that in the current age, a child score greater than 10, which is child C, is an independent predictor of five-day failure. So the thought was, if these patients, we can identify patients that are likely to fail, why not put the tips right away before they fail. It's a preemptive tips. And this was this study that has, uh, you know, that has been the, the, one of the most recent advances. It's, it's a multicenter European study that looked at early, what they call early, and I like to call it preemptive tips in high-risk patients. The like high-risk patients were mostly child C patients. They stopped at 13, so they did not include child scores 14 and 15, just 10 to 13 or child B with active bleeding, but these were really like a minority of the patients. They're mostly child C patients. They randomized it to TIPS versus standard therapy. The endpoint was a combined endpoint, and clearly it was much better for TIPS than for standard therapy. But what is very impressive is that mortality was significantly lower in the TIPS-treated group compared to the standard therapy group without differences in encephalopathy, which was sort of amazing, actually. So. This is one study, okay? Um, they have tried to, they just published recently in Journal of Hepatology, another post hoc study trying to look at the follow up of these patients and saying that they maintain the differences. The problem is that this mortality is very high. First of all, only 18, notice that only 18% of the patients qualified to, were eligible to enter the study. And this mortality was very high. If you look at recent studies that have the same standard of care, you more have mortality between 20 and 29%, not 39. So 39% seems a little steep. And in fact, another study that looked at 49 patients that would have been eligible for this early TIP study, but that were treated with just standard therapy, the mortality was only 10%. So that's why we cannot go crazy and say, let's recommend early TIPs for everybody. The other thing that I, it's very scary because this study has been very misinterpreted so that everybody thinks that early tips is for everybody. If you look at child A patients, the mortality is nil. In that American Journal of Gastro that I just showed you, out of 40 child A patients, only one died. So essentially, child A patients that come in with a cell hemorrhage are not going to die. They, you cannot put in early tips in these patients. So what are, is this our new standard? Our new standard is the same one, but perhaps this is where we start stratifying. In child C patients, we have to consider, and this was the Baveno recommendation, preemptive tips in the first 24 to 48 hours, so before the patient fails. What I tell my, 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 my staff is that I talk to the endoscopist. If the endoscopist didn't feel comfortable with the ligation, I send the patient to tips. If within the first 12 hours there's any instability, any decrease in hemoglobin in a child C patient, I send to tips. And it, there hasn't been that many, let me tell you. Otherwise, we would only recommend tips and failures of standard therapy. Now, the key here is that if we do not do something before the patient leaves the hospital, the rebleeding rate is about 60% patient if we, in the untreated group. This is clearly much more anxiety producing than if you look at the first bleeding rate. Remember, it was less than 20%. So here, we're going to have to be more aggressive. And the therapy that over the years has shown to have the lowest rebleeding rate is the combination of ligation and, and drug therapy, non-selected beta blockers plus minus nitrous. You have the lowest percent. 
Now, if a patient who's on chronic therapy with ligation and drugs fails and re-bleeds again, what one has to put in is a TIPS. At this point, it is a second-line therapy in patients who fail ligation and drugs. Now, having said this, the lowest re-bleeding rates are actually in those who are HVPG response. So like what, when one treats high blood pressure, the key here would be if we had an easy way to measure portal pressure, we would be monitoring therapy by measuring portal pressure. There is not good evidence of HVPG guided therapy. There's a single randomized trial that showed no difference between uh, ligation and drugs and HVPG guided therapy, but we're still trying to figure out what to do with the non-responder. So for now, this is nothing, nothing that is clinically applicable. But the key here is that HVPG responders not only bleed less, but also die less. Another evidence that if we act on the path of physiology of the disease, we will prevent outcomes and we will prevent death. Now let's go on to another stage that I call further decompensation that many people are now calling acute on chronic liver disease. And this is obviously near to death. These are patients that present with recurrent variceal hemorrhage, refractory ascites, hepatorenal syndrome, and jaundice. This is where I'm placing jaundice now. And let's talk about the natural history of ascites, refractory ascites, and hepatorenal syndrome because they have a common pathophysiology, as I'll show you now. So again, let's go back again. There's another form of showing the same thing. Cirrhosis leads to an increase in intrahepatic resistance. This leads to portal and sinusoidal hypertension. And the sinusoidal hypertension drives fluid out into the abdomen. Now, this would be a finite process if it were, because there's something that's replenishing the intravascular volume, and that's why we have the spike against systemic vasodilatation that we were talking about. This leads to a decrease in effective arterial blood volume, increase in activation of neurohumeral systems, and here's renin, angiotensin, aldosterone, sympathetic nervous system, and ADH, all right? These are the neurohumeral systems. They lead to sodium retention. They replenish the volume, so ascites continues to be formed. If this vasodilatation gets worse, and there's a further decrease in effective arterial blood volume. There's more activation of these neurohumeral systems. So now there's added sodium retention so that diuretics cannot, cannot make it better. The patient develops refractory ascites. If in addition to retaining sodium, now they're retaining free water because of the increase in ADH, you'll get free water retention that leads to a dilutional hyponatremia. And in its maximum, when they're maximally activated, you get renal vasoconstriction, and this leads to hepatorenal syndrome. So in a way, this whole thing from ascites to hepatorenal syndrome is part of the same spectrum of disease. So what do we do with the patient with ascites? The easiest thing is to increase sodium excretion by the use of diuretics. Now, since what is driving sodium retention is aldosterone, one needs a blocker of aldosterone, so that's why spironolactone is your diuretic of choice. And this is an incredibly simple old study, but it had 40 patients, 19 randomized to spironolactone alone, 21 to furosemide, a more potent diuretic. Um, you can see here how 18 out of 19 responded to spironolactone alone compared to only barely half of the patients on furosemide. And when these patients were placed on spironolactone, 10 of these responded, showing that if you're going to use diuretics in the serotic phase, you have to block aldosterone by using spironolactone. Now, what about refractory sites? It gets to the point where the patient is no longer responding to diuretics. So one of the simplest therapies has been to just stick a needle in there and take the fluid out. The most ancient therapy, but that's where we are right now, all right? <laughs> ancient therapy. Now, we usually give albumin, and this, these were the studies that looked at something that's called the post-parasynthesis circulatory dysfunction. And these are patients that got albumin. You see no changes in plasma rendering activity. Whereas patients that did not get albumin after the parasynthesis had an increase in plasma rendering activity. And this is what is called post-parasynthesis circulatory dysfunction. You would say, well, who cares? You know, we don't measure plasma rendering activity, you know, in our routine clinical care. But these patients that develop this post-parasynthesis circulatory dysfunction have a much higher rate of developing renal failure and hyponatremia later on. And it's because apparently when you do not give out, the paracentesis itself leads to vasodilatation. So if you place it here, and this is another study I don't have time to present to you, if you do an LVP without albumin, there's an increase in splatting vasodilatation that drives the whole system towards hyponatremia and hepatorenal syndrome. So what do you do to prevent this? You increase the effective arterial blood volume by giving albumin, all right? And 
in a way, albumin is not only an, an expander of the volume, it also may have vasoconstrictive effects as it binds nitric oxide. So we think that albumin has extra properties that go beyond its, its, its plasma expansion. And, um, and so this, these are, this is a recent meta-analysis that looked at, at anything compared to albumin, can we use any other volume expander? And this is the first part for other volume expanders and clearly albumin has a much better effect in preventing uh, post prostatitis circulatory dysfunction than other, vaso, than, than other volume expanders. When you look at vasoconstrictors, and it makes sense, you know, the, the thing that's driving is vasodilatation, so let's give a vasoconstrictor. Um, it seems that they're the same, albumin and control, but most of these studies use terlipressin. We just published a study using oxytide and nitidrine, and our results were not, I mean, the, the rate was the same, but it seemed to not work as well as albumin. So it's, it's published in clinical gastroenterology and hepatology, and we can discuss this later. So for now, if you're going to use volume expanders, use albumin. Now, the key again, let's act on the pathophysiology. Let's just not just take a needle and take the fluid out. TIPS makes total sense. This is TIPS, you know, this is the, the sinuses are hypertensive. You know, you put the TIPS in there, it decompresses. All the sinuses are now being deviated through this TIPS, plus all the blood that's sequestered in this plaguing circulation is now refilling the volume. So it sounds great, and it is great. You know, it, 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 it decreases recurrence of ascites. The problem is that it has more encephalopathy and no changes in mortality in main analysis. However, in this, in the, it, this main analysis of individual patients, of, of five trials um, that were randomized, these include four trials, and they could demonstrate that survival was better in TIPS patients than in those treated with parasitosis without significant differences in, in encephalopathy. And the patients that did the best were those that had a male score of less than 15. So I think that there's a role, and again, this is just something I, uh, that, that I'm thinking of, of preemptive tips for a site. Not wait until the patient is so sick that when you put a tips in, they're going to go the bad way. But when they start being refractory, one should consider putting a tips early on when the male is still less than 15. Now, like, moving right along. What is the main mechanism, therefore, that leads to this first decompensation, as I showed you for, for refractory sites and HRS, is worsening vasodilatation. Obviously, for jaundice, it's worsening in liver synthetic function. And one of the main mechanisms by which this vasodilatation occurs is because of these patients developing infections. And look at this. Cirrhotic patients have a higher likelihood of developing a bacterial infection when they're hospitalized, particularly those with cirrhosis and, and who come in with a GI hemorrhage. This is compared to populations that are not cirrhotic. So it would make sense that we, you can prevent the infection, you could prevent this further decompensation. Now I'll show you the data on variceal hemorrhage and recurrent variceal hemorrhage. And this, this leads to the recommendation that I told you about standard therapy for patients who come in bleeding. The, this is a, these two first set of bars is a main analysis of five trials comparing no antibiotics versus antibiotic therapy in patients with cirrhosis who get admitted with a GI hemorrhage. And you see the infection rate is about 50%, goes down to less than 20% significantly so. But what is very important from this main analysis is that patients who receive prophylactic antibiotics died less. So it's a reduction mortality. This is about the only thing that has been shown in patients with varices and variceal hemorrhage that, that, that actually improves survival is antibiotic therapy during the time of the bleed. And part of it is because you prevent rebleeding. It's not only because they don't die mostly of sepsis, they die of rebleeding. And the reason is with infection, you may get more TNF, more nitric oxide, more splaclin vasodilatation, more flow, and more portal pressure. So that's, this is, again, sort of a proof of concept. The other thing is, how about infections worsening vasodilatation? Can we use antibiotics to prevent ascites to hepatorenal syndrome? And again, this is proof of concept. This is a study that very, very sick cirrhotic patients, these were patients that had low protein ascites, but they also had either what I call circulatory dysfunction, which is they already had a high cretinal BUN and low serum sodium, or had advanced liver failure with a child score greater than nine and bilirubin greater than three. So these are six cirrhotic patients who were randomized to placebo or norfloxacin. And look at this. They prevented SVP, but they, what, what is very important here is that they prevented HRS from occurring. The placebo patients developed much more HRS than norfloxacin treated patients. And at least for the first three months, there was a different difference in survival. Proof of concept, I 
I'm very hesitant about recommending antibiotics in general, because let me just show you the data from our center. This is our Klatskin service. We looked at culture positive infections in our hospitalized cirrhotic patients. 50% of all infections are now due to infections due to multi-resistant organisms. Most of them are VRE and, and, and ESBL. And the main predictor of who's going to develop these infection is antibiotic use in the previous 30 days. So, so you know, in, in one way, I like to show the use of antibiotics as, as a proof of concept as, as, as how the pathogenesis works, but the other part is we have to select very, very carefully who's going to receive antibiotic prophylaxis. Now, moving right along, let's talk about infections. So the patient that comes in infected, and the most common infection is spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. This clearly leads to an increasing base of dilatation, and, 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 and it drives the system towards acute kidney injury. And, and, and the most important predictor of death in someone with SVP is a patient who, who develops acute kidney injury. And so what should we do? Well, we should treat, obviously, with antibiotics. But can we do something if we get albumin and we increase the effect of arterial blood volume, would we prevent this acute kidney injury from occurring? And the answer is yes. And this is already a classical study out of the Barcelona group that randomized patients to antibiotics alone versus antibiotics plus albumin. And you can see here how there was a significant decrease in renal dysfunction, hospital mortality, and three-month mortality. And if you look at the paper very carefully, this was actually not preventing. It was treating very early kidney dysfunction because the patients that most benefited were those that already had a creatinine of greater than one, BUN greater than 30, or were John. So these were the thicker patients, the patients that already having some degree of acute kidney injury were the ones that benefited the most from getting albumin. Now, let's move on. Once you have ruled out infection or treated the infection, you rule out vasodilators, diuretics, the whole thing, you're let, and you, the patient still has acute kidney injury, you have made the diagnosis of hepaterenal syndrome. So what are we going to do about hepaterenal syndrome? We give them albumin to increase the volume, but we also now want to use vasoconstrictors. These are sick patients. So I'll show you the data on vasoconstrictors, and again, trying to give it a pathophysiological point of view. This is our study. This is a multi-center, uh, mostly U.S. study, comparing placebo versus terribly pressing, a potent vasoconstrictor. The creatinine clearly goes down, no question, and, and there was a, a higher uh, regression of, of hepatorenal syndrome. But what's very interesting is this recent meta-analysis that looked at the changes in MAP, in mean arterial pressure. So these things are vasodilated. The clinical correlate of this vasodilatation is hypotension. So this is very, very cool. You know, there was an inverse relationship between the mean arterial pressure, changes in mean arterial pressure and creatinine. So that patients had the highest increase in mean arterial pressure had the, had the most reduction in creatinine. Again, showing that this is what we want to do. We want to reverse vasodilatation, we vasoconstrict, we increase the mean arterial pressure. And this is, uh, the, the, there's also more recently announced from this year, which I don't know that, that the Cochrane group did again, showing the same thing, that if you do um, terribly pressing, these are mostly terribly pressing studies, you have a, 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 a greater resolution of HRS than if you don't do anything. But notice that, again, only 50% of the patients actually resolve the HRS, even with, with, with the vasoconstrictor. Mortality is lower in those who received the vasoconstrictor. This is the only study that had a true title, the rest were totally present, but the mortality is still very high. So therefore, these patients are sick patients. This is, these are just therapies that are a bridge to transplantation. So these are the main pathogenic mechanisms. You have increasing liver fibrosis. You have increasing portal pressure as the main mechanism from compensation to decompensation. You have worsening hypodynamic circulatory state and worsening liver function in the in this transition from decompensated to further decompensation. And so therefore, what are we going to do? What is the rational approach? There, in the earlier stages, we eliminate the etiologic agent. In the compensated to decompensated, we want to decrease portal pressure. And I showed you a lot of evidence for this. In the further decomposition, we have to ameliorate the circulatory state, maybe. And I showed examples of how antibiotics may do this. And obviously, at one point, we have to decide where we're going to decrease liver fibrosis. When the patient is already very sick, we have to replace the sick liver. Now, going back to the clinical, these are my last two slides. So when you're seeing the patient, the patient has compensated cirrhosis. You treat the etiologic agent, and you screen for viruses in HCC.